Hello and welcome to Global News Today, bringing you exclusive insights and fresh perspectives from leading experts and influential decision makers every weekday here on Al Arabiya News. I'm Tom Burgess Watson, coming up on today's program. Israel says it has launched a ground invasion in Lebanon, targeting Hezbollah in what it calls a limited and targeted operation. The Lebanese Prime Minister Najib Mikati says his country faces one of the most dangerous faces of its history. As airstrikes continue, both sides prepare for a potential long battle. Lebanon's Speaker of Parliament calls on the UN for aid as nearly an estimated one million people in the country are thought to be displaced. Welcome. Israeli forces have now crossed into southern Lebanon, launching what the Israeli military is describing as a limited, localized and targeted ground operation against Hezbollah. Well, according to the Israeli Defense Forces, this ground incursion aims to neutralize targets which they view as an immediate threat to nearby Israeli communities. The Israel Defense Forces is conducting limited and targeted raids along Israel's northern border against the threat Hezbollah poses to civilians in northern Israel. These localized ground raids will target Hezbollah strongholds that threaten Israeli towns, kibbutzim and communities along our border. Hezbollah turned Lebanese villages next to Israeli villages into military bases already for an attack on Israel. Hezbollah had prepared to use those villages as staging grounds for an October 7th style invasion into Israeli homes. Hezbollah planned to invade Israel, attack Israeli communities, and massacre innocent men, women, and children. I want to make it clear. Our war is with Hezbollah, not with the people of Lebanon. We do not want to harm Lebanese civilians, and we're taking measures to prevent that. We will not let 7th of October happen again on any one of our borders. We will continue doing whatever necessary so that Israeli families can return to their homes in safety and security. Well, Hezbollah's deputy leader, Naim Qasem, has responded to this announcement by the IDF, saying that the group is fully prepared for an Israeli ground offensive. And hinting at the possibility for a protracted conflict, he warned that the battle may be long. Meanwhile, Israeli airstrikes are ongoing. The IDF has confirmed strikes in Beirut, whilst uh, Lebanese officials have reported that a building in a Palestinian refugee camp near Sidon has been hit. Well, as tensions escalate, all eyes are now on southern Lebanon, and the situation is evolving rapidly. So what is the Israeli strategy in Lebanon and how long could this conflict continue for? Well, to help us answer those questions and more, we're joined by the founder and chairman of Israel's Defense and Security Forum and former IDF deputy commander in Gaza, Brigadier General Amir Avivi. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, Israel has begun uh, what it's calling a, a limited uh, ground incursion. Just tell us what this might entail. Well, you know, as we know, from the 7th of October, uh, Hezbollah uh, has attacked us unprovoked, and uh, the danger was that Hezbollah was planning to launch uh, an attack into Israel, just as Hamas did on the 7th of October, uh, with devastating uh, results, with a huge massacre. Uh, so Israel evacuated many of the towns and families. 60,000 Israelis were evacuated in the beginning of the war and sent to hotels and apartments in the center of Israel. And after 11 months, Israel is now going from the defense to the offense in uh, the north. Uh, we have seen uh, what was going on in the last uh, week or two. And now we have to create the terms to bring back safely the citizens home. And in order to do that, we need to create a buffer zone on the other side by dismantling all the terror infrastructure Hezbollah built along the border. Inside Shia towns, they build tunnels, positions, observation, and we have to dismantle all of that and push Hezbollah north. And by doing so, we create a buffer zone that will enable us to bring back safely the citizens home. And after the death of uh, Hassan Nasrallah, uh, would you say that Israel's 
forces are, are starting this uh, offensive with uh, a degree of confidence they perhaps wouldn't have had uh, until this point? Well, for many years, uh, you know, we try to imagine how our, our, our war against Hezbollah, Hezbollah will look like. Um, I have said all along during the war that the day Israel will go down it, we'll see a completely different scenario from what we saw on, uh, in the last 11 months. But even I was surprised at the level of effectiveness and the ability of the IDF in one week almost to destroy Hezbollah. Uh, we are definitely going in with a lot of confidence, with a lot of experience. Our soldiers have uh, gained huge experience in the last eight months fighting Hamas and fighting inside tunnels. Our soldiers, as we speak, are inside Hezbollah tunnels. They found, by the way, a, a map with all the plans of how Hezbollah intended to conquer the Galilee. So we understand how grave and dangerous uh, this was, and this is why it's so important to do this ground incursion. So... Uh... Let's just talk about the death of Hassan al-Assad a little bit more, because uh, a lot of people saying the, the group has indeed, Hezbollah has indeed been degraded and significantly weakened, but uh, would be wrong, wouldn't we, to uh, say that uh, uh, the group is entirely deterred and uh, that they're a spent force? No, definitely. I mean, the, we hit almost all the leadership of Hezbollah. We degraded dramatically their capabilities, but the organization is still functioning to a certain extent. They're still here and they're giving commands, shooting rockets uh, occasionally. It's not over, but Israel is not going to stop. We're going to continue and attack and degrade this organization to the extent that I hope the Lebanese people will really take advantage and they have a, a, a historical opportunity to get rid from this organization that has taken a whole country hostage together with Iran, there can be a bright future for Lebanon, but they really need to seize the moment and get rid of Hezbollah. But there are risks, aren't there, for Israel, given that uh, we assume uh, Hezbollah knows the ground and has perhaps envisaged such a scenario for, for, for many years. Uh, is that something that you think the Israeli troops are acutely aware of? So when we do a ground incursion, of course, uh, the soldiers, the commanders take it very seriously. We understand that there are forces there. We understand there might be a serious fighting. We don't really know what's the motivation on the other side, how they were affected by the fact that Israel toppled all their leadership, what uh, affected them, taking in account that Israel for 11 months have been attacking Radwan forces in South Lebanon systematically, uh, also toppling all their commanders. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, how determined they are, but it's obvious, and to me it's obvious, that Israel will have the upper hand, and anywhere Israel will want to move forward, it will reach uh, all the goals of war. Now, some some analysts are suggesting that, you know, your allies are concerned that perhaps uh, Israel's being lured into a trap here and a ground invasion is what uh, Hezbollah wanted uh, from, from Israel. Do, do you agree with that? I think that being deeply concerned has become a way of living. And I really suggest to our allies, be less concerned and more proactive. Because Israel is fighting a war for the whole Western society. It's not just about Israel. This is a global war against tyranny, against terror. And uh, in this war, Israel is showing to all the West, it can be done. We can win and we can win decisively. So this is the moment to join and fight together against the Iranian nuclear programs dismantling their capabilities and bringing back safety and security and prosperity to the Middle East. Iran has brought the Middle East into chaos. And this is the time to say, that's it. We're going to stop, we're going to dismantle the Shia axis and bring back security and safety and safety, prosperity to the Middle East. Uh, Hezbollah is using, uh, we understand, the Fadi-4 uh, missile. It's Iranian-made. Uh, it's believed to have more explosive uh, power and range than previous rockets. Uh, lacks precision, though. Do you think their weaponry is getting uh, more sophisticated? Well, you know, uh, as the IDF is uh, doing uh, the attack, we, all, we have also very, very sophisticated and advanced uh, air defense many layers. So yes, we are watching and monitoring very carefully uh, all these uh, ballistic missiles and rockets and drones. But so far, I think Israel has managed to deal with this uh, very well. Uh, the forces are very alert, very ready. 
And uh, also the citizens know that if they, there is something going on, they, they know they need to find shelter at the right place and keep safe. Uh, at the moment, uh, Israeli troops are, we understand, inside uh, Lebanese territory. Uh, not very far inside, I don't believe, but maybe you can correct me on that. Um, where else are Hezbollah's strongholds in Lebanon? Because they're not just in the south, are they? No, we have uh, a lot, uh, Aziz and Nasser uh, brigades of, uh, of Hezbollah are in south Lebanon, south of the Litani. You have Badr. Uh, north of the Litani, uh, all the way to the Awali. And beyond that, of course, you have uh, units of missiles and so on. But most of Hezbollah, most of their units are, are in South Lebanon and a bit beyond the Litani River. Uh, this is the area where Israel really needs to, to operate. And the minimum, minimum needed for a safe buffer zone is around, I would say, 10 to 12 kilometers. This is the range of the anti-tank missiles they have been shooting again and again on Israeli towns. So in order to really prevent a Hezbollah ground incursion or shooting anti-tank missiles, Israel has to hold a buffer zone at the minimum of 12, maybe 13 kilometers, and it can go all the way to the Litani River and beyond. Uh, the UN today warned against what it called a large-scale ground invasion. Uh, they warned of terrible consequences for uh, civilians. Um, from an Israeli perspective, was a ground invasion really the only available course of action at this stage, would you say? Yes, definitely. There is no other choice because um, basically everything we could do from the air we did, but you have very deep tunnels. We saw that in Gaza. I mean, in Gaza, again and again, we conducted operations from the air, and we saw this is not effective. If you don't go into the tunnels and fight, you don't destroy this infrastructure, it, it becomes a huge uh, danger. There are things that cannot be solved from the earth. Uh, you need, at the end of the day, you need to deal with this on the ground. But from, a, from the, the risk of, of civilian casualties point of view, would you say that a ground incursion brings, brings more risk? Or would you say that the aerial bombardment and uh, what Israel called the, the targeted attacks uh, approach, which was the approach for the, the previous uh, uh, week or so, which is more risky for, from a civilian point of view? So the way uh, we are dealing with the issue of civilians is we ask them before starting the attacks to evacuate the area. I can say that in the past 11 months, 90 percent of the citizens who live in South uh, Lebanon left north. Uh, in the last two weeks, the remaining citizens left, and mostly from the cities of uh, Tzor and Sidon. Uh, so this area is pretty empty now. We're talking about citizens, and uh, we, we see mostly terrorists, and this is what we're going to do with. Iran says that your acts will not go uh, unanswered. Uh, what sort of a response uh, do you think Israel is preparing for at the stage from Iran? So we have been preparing for 18 years to deal with Hezbollah, but we've also been preparing for 18 years to deal with Iran. And this is the moment. And I say, bring it on. Let's see what you can do. And uh, I think that uh, Israel has an interest to really end this and really break this Shia axis, including dealing with Iran and dealing with their capabilities. We cannot have a reality where, where Iran is terrorizing the whole Middle East and Israel and also moving towards nuclear capabilities. So what sort of scenario might we be looking at? Well, it depends. It depends uh, where the U.S. will be, the national coalition, and whether Israel needs to deal with this alone. But Israel can hit uh, Iranian military sites and, and also infrastructure in a very, very strong way. Uh, and I, think, I don't think Israel will hesitate to do it if needed and when needed. And what do you think the point of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's address to the Iranian people was at the start of this week? What, what do you think he's seeking to achieve by addressing them directly as he did in that pre-recorded video message? So I, we know that uh, the Iranian regime is not only terrible to the region and to the globe, but also to the, own, the, the Iranian people. Uh, and uh, I think that many, many people in, in Iran would like to see a regime change. And just as we are talking about Lebanon and the opportunity for the Lebanese to get rid of Hezbollah and build for themselves a much better future, same goes for the people of Iran. 
they need to seize the moment and deal with their uh, regime. And maybe if there will be a coalition or Israel uh, deals with this regime, this will be an opportunity also, also for the Iranian people. Uh, General, we understand that uh, Iran is reported to be in the process of launching a ballistic missile in Israel's direction. That's according to a U.S. source. I just want to get your your thoughts on that and what, what the likelihood is of that uh, being intercepted or, or not, as the case may be. And so, as I mentioned, Israel, Israel their defense is building layers, and the upper layer is Arrow 2 and 3. Um, they deal with threats in space, ballistic missiles, with huge success. And I believe that uh, this ability to deal with this long-range uh, ballistic missiles uh, has been proven throughout the war. Uh, but we need to be alert, as always, and be ready for any scenario. Um, what do people in Israel think about what's happening now? Because I know the country has had some political turmoil in the last uh, year or two. Uh, and I'm just wondering what the polls suggest with regards to the actions that have been taken uh, in the last uh, uh, couple of days. I think that, uh, I would say that what we see is relief. People say they, they didn't see, know how a war with Hezbollah would look like. We had very serious scenarios, thousands of uh, missiles and rockets being shot at Israeli cities. People are happy to see that we managed to topple all, all of Hezbollah almost, and it wasn't the case. And, and Israeli people overall are very, very resolute, and they want a decisive victory on all fronts, and they're willing to fight as much as needed to really, really change uh, the future of Israel and the region. Uh, I think that... Uh, Many times our enemies tend to watch too much Israeli TV and there's not even a remote connection between TV and reality in Israel. There's a big difference between commentators and Israeli society. The Israeli society is strong, resolute and want to win. Uh, and just lastly, uh, looking forward, uh, General Avivi, we're about a week away from the first anniversary of the uh, 7th of October Hamas attacks on Israel. Uh, still that war uh, ongoing in Gaza, uh, Hamas undefeated as yet. Um, might Israel's operation in Lebanon uh, therefore be similarly long drawn out, in your opinion? I think that uh, what's happening in Lebanon will have a lot of impact in Gaza. When Hamas sees Hezbollah destroyed systematically, and they are already dismantled militarily, it's a very strong message what comes next. We are not forgetting we have 101 hostages. We are not forgetting the goals of war we set in Gaza, and we are going to achieve all the goals of war in the north, in the south, and in the east. Okay. Thank you very much indeed for taking the time to speak to us. Brigadier General My pleasure. Avivi, thank you very much indeed. Well, for more on the situation in Lebanon, I'm joined now by the senior editor at Carnegie Middle East Center and the author of The Ghosts of Martyrs Square. That's an eyewitness account of Lebanon's life struggle. Michael Young, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to speak to us. You also write for uh, the Daily Star newspaper there uh, in Lebanon. And since you're in the country right now, let me start by asking you what the latest is you're hearing with regards to the situation on the ground uh, right across the country today. Well, it's a little bit uh, unclear, to be very honest, because on the one hand, the Israelis are saying that they're um, operating inside Lebanon and they've released videos, short videos, uh, showing troops inside um, tunnels, uh, Hezbollah tunnels. Uh, but at the same time, until about an hour, an hour and a half ago, uh, the, the United Nations forces in Lebanon, as well as the Lebanese army, were saying that there had been no in Israeli land incursion uh, that they recorded into Lebanon. So it's a little bit confusing exactly what's going on. I mean, it seems that uh, the Israelis are preparing to enter uh, Lebanese territory. They have apparently, uh, I was reading, just mobilized uh, a number of additional brigades. But it seems that they haven't begun operating uh, uh, in a major way yet. Yeah, well, as we've been speaking, we've been receiving reports of uh, fresh strikes on uh, Beirut by the uh, Israeli military. Um, we heard the Prime Minister of Lebanon, Najib Mikati, saying today that the country faces 
uh, one of its most dangerous moments in its history. Now, as someone uh, like you who spent most of their life in Lebanon, I, I just wanted to ask you, is that how it feels to you at this stage? Well, yes. I mean, of course, Lebanon has had many very dangerous periods in its history, um, at least in my lifetime. Uh, but definitely um, what's taking place today is, uh, let's begin with the humanitarian uh, disaster, the catastrophe in the country. We have over a million Lebanese who are basically uh, refugees in their own country. We have a country that essentially collapsed economically in 2020 and has not really uh, introduced any of the reforms to revive itself. So at several levels, Lebanon is uh, already, uh, if, if not a failed state, but a failing state. So on top of this, we have this, uh, what is a major, uh, you know, a major war that that's, is sort of taking, taking shape. So obviously it is very dangerous for the country and indeed for its, uh, we have to see how it comes out of this, this war. Um, I, I, I share his, uh, his, um, his pessimism. And also a, a, a source of pessimism and just looking at social media, I mean, I get the impression a lot of people there in Lebanon feel they've been somewhat abandoned by the international community, uh, uh, ignored even by the international community. Do you think that's an accurate reading of what people are feeling right now? Well, uh, to be honest, I, I don't think that's quite the case. Uh, I think that what many people are feeling, to be very blunt, is anger that the country should have been pushed into a war that was completely unnecessary. Um, and I feel that there is a, a great deal of ambient resentment against uh, Hezbollah's essentially uh, miscalculations that have led the country into this situation. Now, of course, um, there is also anger in Lebanon more, more broadly since the last year at, at the way uh, many Western countries, for example, have, have signed off or have basically looked the other way on what Israel did in Gaza. There is certainly an a certain amount of, of anger that whenever it seems Arabs are killed, the, you know, uh, many countries, supposedly democratic countries, don't really seem to pay much attention. But I think today in Lebanon, as I said, there is a very mixed set of feelings. Many Lebanese today are wondering why we are at war with Israel. I mean, it's, not, it's incomprehensible that anyone should take the country into a war when essentially our economy collapsed. Uh, millions of Lebanese have been impoverished in the last four years. It's just incomprehensible why we're in, why, why we're in this war. I just want to pick up on what you were saying there, because in the last few days, I mean, as we've been covering this, uh, these developments in, in Lebanon, we heard a lot of people in the early stages of uh, the, the, the airstrikes and so on, a lot of solidarity. Uh, it seemed like Lebanese society was extremely uh, united in, in, in its uh, sentiment about what was happening to the country. Um, but it sounds as though there is now some anger, as you say, directed at Hezbollah. And I'm just wondering if you think public support for Hezbollah is now uh, faltering. Uh, I know it's not universal support from across the board in Lebanon, but would you say the, the pockets that did support Hezbollah are now less supportive of Hezbollah than they were, say, a week ago? Well, I would say that there was solidarity for the victims of the Israeli bombing. Of course, this is what where there was solidarity with people who essentially were being bombed and, you know, or injured by the, the pager explosions. Certainly there was solidarity with these people. I don't think there has been much solidarity in the country with, the, with, the, uh, with Hezbollah's decision to go to war. Even close allies of Hezbollah, and I'm referring here, for example, to the former president, Michel Aoun, warned Hezbollah not to involve itself in this war telling them you will not win this war and what you're going to do is take Lebanon into the abyss. Unfortunately, we've reached the stage where, um, you know, we, we seem, we may escape falling into the abyss, but we're very close to it. And I think everyone today is wondering again, why, why we picked a fight with Israel at a time when the country was essentially collapsing. Our institutions have collapsed in the last four years since the economic collapse. The country is, is barely functioning in many regards. The administration is barely functioning. This is not a country that can afford a major war against uh, Israel, particularly when we have the example of Gaza for the last year 
you know, as a background to this. Sure. And just talking about Lebanese institutions that are, are not functioning, there is, of course, no president. There hasn't been a president in, in Lebanon for two years. Um, can steps now be taken uh, to appoint an interim president, uh, you know, given the state of, uh, of emergency that the country is under? Or do you think such a move wouldn't really make any particular difference? I think it would make a difference, but the problem is yesterday the Prime Minister and Speaker of Parliament said there would be no election of a president until the ceasefire. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, even even officials in, in the state are actually not doing anything to fill the vacuum in the state, because this is all, it has become a political decision. Um, you know, the, the, the political class in Lebanon is divided over who should be president. There is no consensus, and therefore uh, both the Prime Minister and Speaker don't want to push the issue uh, because it would put additional pressure on Hezbollah at a time when the party is, of course, engaged in a, in a battle with Israel. But I think we should have a president, uh, and you're, you're absolutely right. This is a vacuum that we cannot afford. Uh, and just lastly, I want to ask you a, a question about the Lebanese army, because I'm curious to know how they fit in, in a scenario that Israel carries out a fully-fledged ground invasion. What would be the role of the Lebanese army? Well, ideally, the Lebanese army should be protecting Lebanon's borders. But we have to understand that the army itself has uh, basically suffered from the economic collapse of the country. They are not uh, well equipped to resist uh, the Israeli army. So, um, but definitely, definitely, I believe that one of the ways out of our crisis today in Lebanon is uh, the need to reinforce the army, to deploy it to South Lebanon, and in a way to come back to a, if you will, a, 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 a formula to reinforce the state. I'm not sure we will do that, because, but uh, certainly today there are many Lebanese who say it's not normal that an armed group should independently take Lebanon into a war. And therefore, many of these same people are saying it's time to reinforce the state. And you reinforce the state today, among other things, by giving greater responsibility to the one institution in the state, namely the Lebanese army, by giving it more of a role in a national defense and in main the maintenance of security. OK, well, thank you. I'm afraid we're out of time. Really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us, uh, journalist and author Michael Young. Thank you very much indeed. Now, the British Foreign Secretary David Lammy says that no one wants a repeat of Israel's prolonged conflict in southern Lebanon, warning that a regional war would have a substantial cost for the Middle East and impact on the global economy. Well, it comes as the UK has increased the number of British troops at its military bases in Cyprus. Well, for more analysis, I'm joined now by Lord David Owen, who served as the British Foreign Secretary during the 1970s. Thank you very much indeed for speaking to us, Lord Owen. Um, you were Foreign Secretary in the late 1970s when the uh, Lebanese civil war was, uh, was raging. And here we are, half a century later almost. Uh, there must be a, an enormous sense of depressing deja vu for you. Yes, and uh, I think we have some lessons to learn from that period. And one of them, obviously, which Israel is having to weigh is they had a lot of problems when the war reached uh, southern Lebanon and they weren't in and it took a long time. But I am very, uh, hard to say a word for it. It's, it's more than anger, uh, but it's dispassionate. We've got to stop telling these countries how to conduct their own affairs and particularly Israel. So your, your anger is directed at, at, at which country? Are, are the, the West for, for dictating? No, it's, it's President Biden endlessly making calls for a ceasefire. European governments, including our own, doing the same. I mean, we have not got an influence on this situation. Uh, nobody's listening to these endless calls for ceasefires. It, it, it devalues the currency if you start... Uh, on that. If you call for a ceasefire, it's got to be in a period in which it's possible and you can do something to help it. But vacuous calls for ceasefires 
pretenses of telling Israel what they should do as being in the interests of a particular country, Britain or America. Israel is pursuing the interests of their own country and doing so with brilliant effect. So you think Israel is right to have, have started uh, today a, a ground invasion? It's quite in, wrong word to use right. It's not my no, judgment about what they should do. Are they taking a course in uh, their interests? The answer is yes. They have had for year after year after year parts of Israel that cannot be inhabited because of constant shelling uh, or missiles landing on the, their territory uh, from uh, Lebanon. And they are not going to do what they've done successfully, which was to kill the leader of Hezbollah. And they're not going to do all that and then leave the ground, which has been the main root of their problem with the Lebanon. And basically, Israel hasn't a problem with the Lebanon. They have a problem with people using Lebanon ground to attack them with missiles, and they've been doing so for year after year. So telling Israel how to conduct themselves is a waste of time. They know exactly how they're going to conduct themselves, and they're not going to listen to us. And the idea of a ceasefire now is absurd. They're just not going to do it. There is this risk, isn't there, that uh, with, with conflict on, on so many different fronts, uh, that that uh, spectre of a, uh, a regional, fully-fledged conflict is becoming increasingly possible, probable. Do, do you agree with that? I assume by that you mean that Iran joins. Yes, uh, Iran and, and other countries. Player. And I think if Iran was to join the fight, that would be very dangerous and also depressing because I think there is, for the first time for quite some time, with the new uh, leader in Iran, uh, a chance for conducting ourselves in ways in which Iran can become not partners, but um, participants in all serious discussions about the region and treated as they are, of course, as an important country, major country, and as a people with great culture and uh, who can make a very considerable contribution to a peaceful Middle East, and I think are ready to do so. So you're, you would encourage dialogue with, with Iran in order to de-escalate the situation more broadly in the region. Who would you like to see spearheading that, championing that, that dialogue? Sorry, who in that dialogue? Which countries would you like to see taking that initiative and, and, and bringing about that dialogue with Iran? Well, I think the first important thing, if I may, is to go back one step, the crucial step, why did Hamas invade uh, Israel? It was because they sensed that the Abraham Accords were making considerable progress. And the Abraham Accords, for your listeners, has been a three-year dialogue between Israel and other Arab countries. And it was, and still is, as long as we ensure that it is not wrecked by what's happening, it's clear-cut sign that Israel can negotiate with its Arab neighbors in a constructive way of mutual benefit. And we must try and save the ethos underlying the uh, Abraham Accords now. And I therefore think that that should be the background. We know now that there are serious Arab countries that are ready and are already participating in serious negotiations with Israel through the Abraham Accords. And whatever happens, that's the most important thing to keep on the agenda as a positive example of what can, and I think would, if we can keep it there, settle the future of the Middle East. Can you see a scenario, though, in which the UK, uh, the United States, and other regional powers that are opposed to Iran are somehow obliged to join in a broader regional conflict. Do you, think that's a, do you think that's a possible scenario? No, I don't think so. I mean, you know, look at the politics 
America is going heading into a presidential election. Uh, one of the candidates, Trump, says he'll settle the whole thing straight away. Um, no appetite with him for that sort of confrontation. A woman candidate uh, from the Democrats. The idea of uh, America being involved in a war would not help her candidature at all, make it much more certain that Trump would win. So I don't think that uh, President Biden, who's a sensible man, has been around a long time, would dream of getting America involved in the fighting. So what, what is your, your prediction if, if indeed, let's imagine a scenario in which Donald Trump is uh, once again President of the United States. Uh, he's got this reputation as being a, a deal maker. Imagine he, he does uh, walk into the White House in January. What, what do you think he's going to bring to the table here? Do you think he'll be able to draw a line under uh, the conflict between Lebanon and Israel? I think he would want to talk between Lebanon and uh, Israel. And I think he has already shown through the activities of his uh, son-in-law, who is behind the Abraham Accords, that he would settle uh, a framework for negotiations. He did that in a way by putting a British embassy, an American embassy back into uh, um, Jerusalem. He showed us a, a quite a good idea, a good perspective of how to get peace in the Middle East. And he, he would follow the somewhat similar policies if he came back in. But let's, there are many uh, tricks in Cup, many a slip to its cup and lip between now and then. So let's not go into what is going to happen if and when we get a presidential election and Trump is elected. Let's look at the situation we should do now. And now we should be quietly using diplomatic means to have a dialogue with the people who are fighting and try to interpose logic and reason into their thinking so that they can come to a negotiated settlement. So it means Lebanon has to live with the fact that they were the place where Hezbollah had their headquarters and had their strength, and that's been taken out, and now they must live peacefully within the region and within a relationship with Israel. And if they could quickly get that new impression in Tel Aviv, the Israelis might only go in and uh, focus on Hezbollah troops on their border and then get out. Uh, if we don't get some form of understanding of the Israeli position, they'll go in and stay in, and that would make life very difficult for future negotiations. So. I, I would hope that uh, Israel will not stay in southern Lebanon, but they're bound to stay long enough to get rid of some of the people who are firing missiles at them. Can we assume that in the background the UK is playing a role, talking to both sides? After all, uh, the United Kingdom has diplomatic relations with both countries concerned. Do, do you assume, therefore, that advice is being given uh, to both sides by London? I think London historians or London former diplomats can use their personal relationships with individuals to influence events. I think Britain has tied its foreign policy in that region to America, which I think is quite sensible. I have no objection to it. But it means that we're not the dominant player that we once were historically, and that we lost that role, uh, you know, a few decades ago. So I, 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 I think we, at the moment, the key thing is to try to get Iran to understand that Britain and all of the democracies in Europe and the United States want an improved relationship. And we've gone very close to a situation where Iran Im imposes itself into this war. I hope that they will not do so. And I think one of the things that would 
possibly influence them if we conceded what they apparently want. I can't understand why, that they want to go back into the negotiations they had with the nuclear states, in those of us who are in Europe, in Britain, France, and also, of course, the United States, on nuclear questions. Now, that seems to be the status symbol that will go back to when they were recognized and were a proper diplomatic and uh, political negotiating partner. We didn't agree, but we were in formal negotiations with them. They want that restored. If they want that restored, good. Give it to them straight away and quickly before they get themselves sucked into this war, which I think many Iranians are very unsure whether they should or not. And I, I hope they don't, but I think it's a close-run thing as to whether they come in. Indeed, and Iran is, a, is a, an extremely divided country, and we've seen evidence of that in recent years with large protests. And that seems to be what uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was, was sort of counting on yesterday when he made a, a three-minute-long appeal to the people of Iran, uh, urging them uh, not to support their own leaders. I mean, do you think such a message is likely to gain any traction or, or, or change very much? What's your thoughts there? Not really. I think the women in Iran are very unhappy and very dissatisfied. Uh, but I think it's a long way that you can influence what may happen in the future, um, and particularly at a time of war. At a time of war, most countries somehow manage to patch up their differences and rally around the flag. You know, they've got relatives fighting in the armed services. It's difficult. I don't think that Iran is going to uh, shift the attitude of their governing party. You've got to hope that the new uh, leader that has come in, who is not tied to the religious leaders, has got enough independence to keep Iran out of this war and play a quite important role in the peace process that must follow. Just lastly, uh, Lord Owen, um, uh, final thoughts, a final message. How would you advise... Uh, the current British Prime Minister, Sir Keir Starmer, what would you like him to see uh, doing in order to somehow bring some uh, resolution to this conflict in the, in the Middle East? Well, I think he's already done it, and that's very sensible. He spent time with President Biden in the United States recently. He has used the British voice and his foreign secretary to talk to all the different countries. Our friends and neighbours, countries like France, who often share our position, and we're both on the Security Council as permanent members, and we tend to vote together. So there will be some difficult votes. The temptation is always to abstain, but it might be easier, and will, it would undoubtedly be easier, if France and uh, Britain have a slightly different position from the United States, and they want to flag it up in the Security Council, be it abstention or by vote, and France and Britain does that together, I wouldn't exclude that at all. And I would look favorably at it as long as it's done for a purpose, which is to improve the negotiating position to bring Iran around the table. OK, well, we're going to have to leave it there. We're out of time, but we really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us. The former British Foreign Secretary, Lord David Owen. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, for more analysis, I'm joined now by the former Deputy Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs and the Chief of Staff for the National Security Council in the Obama and Clinton administrations. Mara Rudman, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to speak to us. Um, some news just coming into us here at Al Arabiya News. Uh, the U.S. Embassy uh, in Israel is telling its staff to shelter. Uh, the U.S. is warning that an Iranian attack on Israel with a ballistic missile is expected. What do you make of that warning? So I believe the United States is doing everything possible to uh, prepare a strong defensive posture uh, against uh, any and all contingencies. And for them to escalate in this public way, uh, to me, means it's likely uh, that they believe such contingency may occur and want to be sure that they and Israel um, and all civilians in Israel are, are maximally prepared and are probably working with a number of parties through the region, as you saw back last April. 
to to mitigate uh, the effect of any such action by Iran. Okay, so in such a scenario that uh, Israel is hit by uh, some sort of an Iranian uh, attack, I mean, first of all, it's likely to be intercepted, isn't it? Um, but in any case, would that then trigger a further response, do you think, from Israel and the United States? I, I believe that the entire region has, for some time now, been a tinderbox and particularly exacerbated over the last uh, few weeks. Uh, but within Iran, as far as we know, there's also a fair amount of uh, tension or perhaps lack of agreement on uh, um, actions to take or not to take. Um, and I think there are a lot of actors involved in a lot of conversations right now behind the scenes to try to ensure uh, that this does not further escalate in the region. And I would note as well that that, that action was put into place in mid-April very effectively, both in essentially neutralizing the effect of the Iranian strike and then ensuring that um, it did not escalate from that point until obviously where we are now with Lebanon. Um, some analysts have suggested that Iran's uh, still relatively new president, Masoud Pazeshkian, was hoping to improve relations uh, with the West. But at this, time, at this point in time, um, we're talking about armed responses, uh, saber rattling. I mean, that sounds like a very distant prospect, doesn't it? Well, I, as I was referring earlier to the tensions uh, in Iran, I think the fact that uh, the president is, within Iranian terms, a moderate, uh, and the supreme leader uh, would have at some level acquiesced to, uh, to him being put in place, uh, being elected as, as president, uh, underscores that there are tensions within Iran about best approaches and what the, the options are and when and how Iran is, is best situated uh, in terms of uh, their overall goals and direct or major military action at this point for Iran, uh, despite where the Iranian Revolutionary Guards may be or may wish to show reactions, may not be in Iran's best interest. Uh, and so there's a, I would expect a lot of deliberations going on within that country at this point, um, as well as with and among various actors in the region and internationally. Um, just looking at the situation in Lebanon, the uh, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said last night that Washington does support Israel and its goal of, and I quote, dismantling attack infrastructure along the border. Does that equate, do you think, to Washington's support uh, for an Israeli ground offensive? I think it depends on how you define the Israeli ground offensive. Listen, it's very clear the threat that Hezbollah has posed not only to Israel, uh, but to the region as a proxy of Iran um, and in carrying out a variety of uh, terrorist acts, and frankly, not just to the region. Hezbollah has been responsible for the deaths of Americans. Uh, and, uh, and so the interests of the United States and Israel are aligned in the sense of reducing, uh, mitigating, ultimately dismantling the threat that Hezbollah poses. And the actions on the border with Israel are in, can be seen as in continuance of resolution, UN resolution 1701 back in 2006, was, which was meant to move Hezbollah back behind the Litani River, um, away from Israel's border. And so again, the actions that involve being on the ground in Lebanon near the border uh, would be consistent with those goals. I think the challenge and the concern is how quickly it can grow into a, a sense of a bigger mission of more extended ground operation. And that has not played well for Israel um, in the past. And yet uh, we have heard time and time again the Biden administration calling for ceasefires. Uh, but those ceasefire calls uh, have been rejected uh, on a number of occasions. I mean, do you get the impression that there's a degree of frustration in the United States and that uh, power and influence on foreign affairs is, is somewhat diminished? I, I don't have that view. I think that diplomacy is always hard, always difficult, um, and that what the administration of President Biden has been going through in the past year uh, is uh, a very skilled and persistent diplomatic efforts 
uh, balanced with the need to counter the threat that Iran poses, not just to the region, but ultimately to the United States um, and to the rest of the world. And so that involves uh, trying to work with a variety of different uh, leaders in the region who have stakes in this um, and with some stakeholders who, uh, who I would not characterize as leaders in any sense. Uh, and figuring out how you can get to move them to what is in the United States interest, what is in the international interest, and when they may not see it as in their own direct personal interest or in the interest of their country or the entity that they run. That's, that's part of the job of uh, being a, a leader in the world today. But just to continue with the, with the, the, the sort of uh, speculation, really, about Washington's frustration with, with Israel, because we sometimes hear these messages out of Washington to the effect that they are as surprised as the rest of the world by uh, developments. I mean, notably the pager and walkie-talkie attacks, they said they had no prior knowledge of that. They said the same thing about uh, Hassan Nasrallah's uh, targeted killing. I mean, do you think that it's really the case that they're finding things out uh, at the same time as us, or is there some sort of element of theater to all of this? I think it is possible for neither of the things you propose to be on the mark. Um, I do not see our government leaders as being involved in theater. Uh, I see them as being involved in grappling with very real facts on the ground. And those facts may be shifting uh, rapidly as they have in the last couple of weeks. And uh, independent countries are responsible and carry out their own tactics and their own strategies. And the United States is not in a position I think despite how many in the world may view us to impose our will on any other country. And it is a matter of figuring out what points of leverage you have and how to maximize them. And that is what I believe that President Biden and his administration have been doing. Some uh, additional US troops are being deployed to the Middle East. What does that indicate, you think, about where things could be heading to? Well, I think we have troops that are being deployed and we have two carriers in the region, which is, which is significant. And we've had it several points um, over the past year. It involves ensuring that uh, the United States defensive posture uh, is, uh, is clear, clear to actors in the region and to others in the world. Um, and, and in the hopes of, of again, de-escalating uh, the situation that we're in now. Uh, I think folks should, the, the interest in having a strong defensive posture uh, is to deter actions uh, from others and, and show that you can deter by being available uh, to react if and as necessary. But the goal here, I would say, of the increased U.S. presence is further deterrence. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, a couple of months ago you're quoted as saying the U.S. is closer to a major war than it's been in generations and that it is not prepared for that fight. Um, first of all, I hope I've quoted you correctly. And secondly, um, do you think that scenario now looks even more likely given how quickly things have escalated in the last uh, week or two? So I just a, a point on that quote. Uh, it is an accurate uh, reflection of what was written uh, by the reporter. I do not believe the reporter <laughs> accurately quote quoted me. Uh, but to try to give a, a little bit more of what my intended uh, nuance was, I was talking to, to that particular reporter in the context of my work on the U.S. National Defense Strategy Commission, uh, where we had four Republicans, four Democrats. We issued a report this summer that described the very real concerns uh, that many in the United States share, including across our government, uh, about the degree of um, instability throughout the world, uh, the leveraging that bad actors, and I would put in this, con in this in the context of China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, are doing with one another to further various aims. Um, and so to that point, the extent of further instability in the Middle East playing into the concerns about what's already happening in Ukraine with Russia and the ways in which China is looking at all of this uh, for what uh, Chinese leaders have made clear are their kind of ultimate goals um, in the Indo-Pacific is a cause for real concern. And that is part of why the commissioners with whom I worked on our report talked about the need to very much increase uh, 
to change the culture in the United States, to increase awareness and education about the kinds of threats uh, that we are facing in the world and the point of uh, instability uh, that the world is writ large, and to increase the resources in a variety of ways, not just monetary resources, that the United States is putting into uh, a strong defensive posture, a strong national security posture, and frankly, building out the U.S. industrial base, which is also uh, part of uh, what's necessary in this equation. And all of those points is what I was intending to uh, get to in the prior conversation you referenced. Okay, so I mean, when we look at the the context in the Middle East, and we've got uh, Gaza, Lebanon, Syria, all uh, under attack today. I mean, uh, just looking at these fears of a broader regional conflict that people have been talking about really uh, for a year or so now since the seventh uh, of October attacks. I mean, uh, where do you see this heading to? Do do you think a broader regional conflict involving perhaps more actors than the ones I just mentioned is is now looking increasingly likely? I hope that is not the case. I think the flip of what you're describing, Tom, would also be, and I think we've seen it happen, the flip that I'm about to describe in April of the opportunities for regional actors who are serious and concerned about the threat that Iran poses coming together in a strong deterrent posture uh, to be able to counter that threat. And I think a key piece of that is what the United States has been working with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia on, which is hand in hand to find a path forward towards a Palestinian state, um, as well as the that is part and parcel of immediately trying to resolve uh, what's been going on with Hamas in Gaza and have a way forward. And so bringing the region together, uh, both to counter Iran and in a positive direction, uh, with respect to Palestinians and a Palestinian state, a pathway to that Palestinian state that would increase security and stability throughout the region is also a possibility, even as we are facing um, the, the current situation that we're in. Okay, well, we're out of time. Really appreciate you taking the time to share your analysis with us. Mara Rudman, thank you very much indeed. Well, that is all we have time for on Global News today. Thank you very much indeed for watching. Be sure to join us again tomorrow for more exclusive interviews. Until then, bye-bye.